His fate is written. Shall we write yours too? If anything happens to them, there's no place that I won't go to kill you. That is written. with your latitude and longitude. You said the Bering Sea. That was enough. There's not a single person in the theater that's like, oh, that part of the Bering Sea. Now I'm truly intrigued. Um, I get what you're saying, but it's still nice to know the coordinates. Okay, I don't have a rebuttal to this. It'll make more sense later. The most fearsome killing machine ever devised by man. Ooh, are we about to watch Oppenheimer by mistake? Fine by me. I'd rather sit through three hours of a complete movie than two and a half hours of an unfinished one. While I agree Oppenheimer was way better than this, considering this movie is set decades after that one, I have a feeling this weapon is even worse. Spinning camera on a big red ball. Spinning camera inside big red ball. Flashing red lights. AI excitement. Pointing things out on the screen. He's there. Turning with us again. He can see us. It may not be fair, but anytime you have a game of cat and mouse between a top secret Russian stealth sub and an American sub, you're going to get a sin for not being the Hunt for Red October. One thing only, please. Arbitrary movie reference. Hmm, that was early. I kept in, making troop two ready in all respects. Weird, that's the same thing my college girlfriend used to say every naval roleplay night. And a college girlfriend joke. We're only five sins in, and already I'm questioning why this video needed to be 24 minutes long. This weird-ass chess match where five moves in, neither player is attempted to control the middle of the board by the pawn. Pointing things out on the screen again. Can you please give me something better to respond to? He was never there. We've been chasing a phantom. Right, because an AI was like, I have control over this entire vessel in any way I want, but you know what feels fun? A game of ghost chicken. Finally, you completely missed the point of this scene. The entity was tricking this sub into firing missiles at a submarine that isn't even there, so it can then redirect the missiles back, destroying the Sevastopol. I'd say that's pretty clever, because if it shot the missiles itself, the crew would become suspicious immediately. <laughs> I am computer AI. I will make spooky noises and scary eyeball graphics while no one is even in here to see them. You cannot stop me from my pointless grandstanding. And back to weird nitpicking. This is just how the entity works. What's the problem? Not providing me latitude and longitude so I know where exactly in Amsterdam this is. All right, here is why I included that first sin. Jeremy earlier criticized the movie for giving us the longitude and latitudes, and now he's making fun of the movie for not doing that. I'd be okay with this joke if he didn't then add a sin right here. This is the problem with cinema sins, where they treat real critiques and jokes the same, and don't do a good job distinguishing the two. You need to ask me the security question first. Oh, yeah. Sorry. Uh, what is the oath? Trying to offset Tom Cruise's intensity with an adorable Brit as if you didn't already have a Benji serving that purpose. Or maybe the movie is showing a new IMF agent delivering this message, which sets up Ethan telling him he made the right choice, which becomes a main theme of this movie. 30 years ago, you were offered the choice. Join the IMF or spend your life in prison. We're seven movies deep and now you want to give us Ethan Hunt origins? That's the theme I was just talking about. This sets up Grace's choice at the end to join the IMF. So it makes sense for them to now explain why Ethan joined in the first place. There was no reason to bring this up in any of the previous movies. Just as you will never forget the death that brought you to us all those years ago. Yet another sequel jump starts the plot by showing us an event from the protagonist's past that didn't exist until this movie invented it. You have six movies of content spanning 27 years, so why not pull from some of that sh How does this flashback kickstart the plot? All it does is tell us that Ethan knows who Gabriel is. The stakes of this mission are higher than ever. <sighs> of course they are. Higher than that time a Scotsman with a virus was going to wipe out all the world. Or that time those bad guys got a hold of those nukes. Or that time Discount Spectre also got a hold of some nukes. Yeah, it is kind of comical how these movies try to top the previous one. But in this case, I'd say they're even higher, since the main villain is artificial intelligence. The idea that a cold, calculating machine can set off nukes is a scary thought. 
I mean, have you seen Terminator? What should concern you is the involvement of your friend, Ilsa Faust. Wait, wait, wait a f***ing f*** on a minute. Fallout had that subplot about getting Ilsa out of trouble and away from the spy game, and I'm pretty sure Rogue Nation did something similar too. And now she's back in the mix? There had better be a good reason for bringing her back again, and it had better not be to just kill her off for a cheap emotional punch. Ilsa is a part of MI6, and she's one of the most interesting characters in this series, in my opinion. And while I agree her death in this movie sucks, she does at least serve a purpose in this story, getting one half of the key and giving it to Ethan, which actually kickstarts the plot. Continuing to use cassette tapes that could be listened to by anyone who understands how to push the play button instead of encrypted digital audio files. You know this was delivered by an IMF agent, right? I'd assume they'd be trained to keep it under their care at all costs before giving it to the next agent. And you even showed they went through a process of making sure they were on the same team. Some quick movie trivia for you. Tom Cruise spent five weeks training on how to use actual binoculars just to get the scene right. <sighs> Did anyone find this joke funny? Becoming a pirate just because you can't close your left eye. Ilsa is in the middle of the desert during a huge sandstorm. Of course she'd cover one of her eyes to prevent sand from getting in. Sending a very clear message. I shall return. The amount of work this county production of Tennessee Williams' Exposition Descending is doing is insane. It's not only laying out yards of forced factual groundwork, it's then making huge leap assumptions about the motives and next steps of this completely new and unknown entity. The scene is making an ass out of you, me, and itself. And we all know if this scene wasn't here, you'd be complaining that you don't know what the entity is or why we should be afraid of it. But servers require humans to maintain them. And humans are the weakest link in any security chain. Movie dismisses the air gap solution because humans have to maintain it, and instead goes with the type every secret onto paper plan, as if the beings doing the typing, collecting, archiving, and overseeing aren't homo sapien in nature. This whole scene is the dumbest expositional force feeding to ever dumb itself down an audience's throat. Again, this is ironic. You're the same person who's dumbed down a lot of words, from cliché to inception to deus ex machina. An enemy that is everywhere and nowhere. I feel like this guy was cast exclusively because he kind of looks like he'd make a good Terminator. Why did you play this guy's line? It had nothing to do with this arbitrary movie reference. You don't want to kill it, sir. You want to control it. And how do we do that? Mr. Kittredge. Ah, sudden 1996 Mission Impossible callbacks. While I don't object on the whole, it is rather striking that Kittredge is the only minion in this briefing that actually gets a name check, as if he's the only one the scriptwriters cared about. Well, he's the only one who's offering a solution for how to beat the entity, so that's why he addressed him by name. Well, we know that a buyer is uh, passing somewhere through the Middle East sometime in the next 72 hours. Do you know how big the Middle East is? F***ing big is how big. Do you know how long 72 hours is in Spy World? I don't know, but I bet it's f***ing long. It's almost impressive to have actionable intelligence specific enough to be sinful, but vague enough to be useless. Does it have to be specific? I feel like this works just fine enough. So let me get this straight. When there's a mission none of you can handle, you just leave word for a nameless man and hope he gets the job done. David Luckner would be excellent at CinemaSins. This guy sort of leaves out the fact that these nameless men are specifically trained for this and have even succeeded multiple times considering this is the seventh movie. So yeah, I'd say he'd be perfect at CinemaSins. Should he choose to accept it? What the hell kind of outfit? It's to choose what orders to accept. The scene has rapidly become an everything wrong with the IMF in Carrie Elway's minutes or less. Except you cut out the part of the scene that explains the whole choose to accept thing. What the hell kind of outfit? It's to choose what orders to accept. The IMF was expressly created to ensure there would be no unintended consequences. If they cannot ensure a mission's ultimate outcome, they're authorized to decline. This is only a surprise to the movie illiterate watchers who didn't wonder why the movie cut to 17 different close-ups of this random person who didn't speak at all during the scene. Yeah, but it's still pretty sick to watch. Also, there are exactly 22 seconds between the green bombs of immediate impact going off and Ethan taking out his breathing apparatus. You're telling me that no one in that room could hold their breath for 22 f***ing seconds. It's almost like they didn't know this gas was going to go off, so wouldn't have been able to hold their breath in time. Whatever the completed key unlocks. We'll just have to wait a few years, because why have just one movie when you can do less editing work and just make it two? You say this as if this is a question that will be answered in the next movie. 
But the problem is, this movie gives us the answer. It is revealed that it unlocks the Sevastopol, which we saw at the beginning of the movie. The only answer we don't have yet is how Ethan and his friends are going to find the Sevastopol. Stay out of my way. I can't do that. What? Ethan Hunt is going rogue and is about to be disavowed by the people he works for? Didn't see that coming. Oh no, the movie is repeating a plot point, says the guy who calls everything a cliche without knowing what that word means. Also, one way to keep Kittredge out of your way is to not have this conversation with him and let him know you have the key half. What actionable intel did Ethan actually gain during this conversation? I'm guessing he hoped to get the entire IMF to help since the stakes are higher than ever, as Kittredge himself says. He didn't expect them to be all, nah, we can control it. So just how do you plan on getting out of here? Uh, of course. Magical masks that just self-apply in seconds that would take makeup artists hours to accomplish. Yes, we're still sending these masks. It's our mission. And we continue to choose to accept it. I've sent all your previous Mission Impossible videos. I don't remember you criticizing these masks all that often. And besides, they've always been unrealistic. Just go with it. Spoiling your own movie and your own opening credits. <sighs> Still sending these credits, are you? Shouldn't TV shows that supposedly spoil plot points in their opening titles get a sin too? Also waiting 30 minutes to roll them. Oh no, a movie did something unique. What rule dictates when credits should play in a movie? It's time. Hollywood has fallen in love with multi-part films and it always makes the first movie worse. I'm throwing five sins on any and every movie that is a part one from here until I forget to do so. Even if you decide someday to try to hide your sin by dropping the part one from the title, we know half a movie when we see it and we will continue to act accordingly. I'm surprised this is the first time you're doing this. I mean, Harry Potter did that way back in 2010 with the final book. Heck, more recently, Marvel did this with Infinity War and Endgame, and Sony did it with Spider-Verse, and no one seems to be upset about those. And you also split your Star Wars prequel videos into two parts, so I don't think you're one to talk. Truth-eating digital parasite infesting all of cyberspace. X. Does anyone call Twitter X? Because I sure don't. Meaning this very conversation is technically an act of treason. Nope. Technically, an act of treason has to be an actual act. In fact, the only reason the Constitution even mentions treason is so that it can limit it to people who actively levy war against America or give aid and comfort to an enemy of the U.S. Yeah, but this conversation is setting up the acts that they are about to commit. So this is the guy that shot Hunt's lady friend back in the day. Now, I initially assumed the tape mentioned the shooting because the IMF knew that Gabriel was involved, but that was not the case at all. Gabriel had nothing to do with that initial mission to capture Ilsa. It's just a big old sack of coincidence that this guy shows up on this adventure just days after tape guy mentioned him. Okay, and... Coincidences happen all the time in real life. I'm just saying. Packing twice as many guns as you need for the job. How many pairs of shoes do you really need, Susan? Did you not hear that guy say they need to capture Ethan at all costs? Wait, yes he did. You literally sent that scene. His agenda represents a threat to our national interest and he must be neutralized at all costs. When you say at all costs, do you really mean that? So how did you immediately forget about that? How did you do that? No one is safe from Phineas Freak. And that non-answer is all the explanation we will ever get about that. See? You earlier criticized the movie for giving you too much exposition, and now you're mad the movie isn't giving you enough of it. What if somebody is trying to smuggle a bomb onto that plane? And what if that's what the entity wants us to think, to keep Ethan off that plane? In two sentences, the movie cell phones by showing how nothing in this entire part one can actually be understood or truly matter to the audience. You sure about that? Because judging by the audience scores, people seem to understand this movie just fine. Whoa, whoever she is, she's no spy. Not understanding that people contain multitudes. How is that related to what Luther was talking about? Hi. Hello. Oh, just f already. I'll scream. Please do. Oh, just f already. Yelling at the screen. And why was this drive in your pocket? Ethan pickpockets back the key in the drive without her knowing and then decides to just let her know through some quick magical callbacks. But why? How does this help him? Isn't he skilled enough to put them back on the mark himself or figure out a cover story? He's literally offering her money by explaining what the keys are worth. And she's more skilled at pickpocketing than him. So what do I call you? How about... Grace. The key is a crucifix. You're named Grace. At least the person helping the entity isn't named after an angel. That might be a bit too on the nose. What does her name being Grace have anything to do with that? I get you're pointing out the on the nose symbolism, but I don't see how Grace fits in there. Also, it appears to be nuclear. How big? I mean, does it 
doesn't matter how big. If this is a baby nuke, would the outcome be any different? Is Luther going to say, don't worry, Benji. If it's small, we'll just let it explode and kill a bunch of people and make a good chunk of Abu Dhabi uninhabitable for the next century or dozen. No biggie. How is this a real question? He's obviously wondering how big of an explosion it would cause. I'd be curious about that too. I haven't got any tools. Then find some. Well, where am I going to find... Did he just grab a random passenger bag and whip it open to search for bomb disarming tools? Unless you're planning to use a toothbrush, a belt buckle, or a vibrator for this job, I'm thinking that's quite an ask. Maybe you should have checked what Benji used. I did, and he used a fingernail clipper. I don't think airport security would mind that. What's always approaching, but never arrives. Wait, 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 I know this one. The clock is ticking, Luther. Riddles aren't my thing, Benji, what more can I say? You just said you knew this one, you backpedaling when he said he knew it, he meant he'd heard it before. He just had to try and recall what the answer was. I've done that plenty of times. I've got no more questions and there's one more wheel. How am I supposed to give answers if I've got no questions? I've got 45 seconds. Did he not just spin the f***ing dial? He said there were 14 letters on each ring and he's got 45 seconds to go. That's like three seconds for each ring. Start spinning, Benji. But if he gets it wrong, what if the bomb explodes? He also doesn't know what the letters spell out until he looks underneath it and notices it spells good luck. Tom Cruise finds an excuse to sprint in a movie cliche. And it never gets old unlike these videos. But it has allowed us to keep tabs on this woman. Figuring out how to do this coordinated analog PowerPoint presentation between these cathode ray TVs in a totally computer-free environment is exactly why you can't trust the government to spend your tax money wisely. Wouldn't that be a sin for the government and not the movie? Graft him alive, extortion in Mumbai. But this is my favorite, resisting arrest in Rio. I need an entire TED Talk and maybe even a supplemental masterclass on why this man finds resisting arrest in Rio to be his favorite. Uh, another case of you asking for information that is unimportant to the plot of this movie. I mean, it's almost three hours long for Pete's sake. Characters we barely know are being watched by another character we've barely seen at all to intersect with a third character we just met who's being followed by a villain that hasn't said a single word in a movie that's been going for almost an hour with hardly any plot advancement. Let's go! Hardly any plot advancement? You know, if you don't count Ilsa grabbing one half of the key, then giving it to Ethan, then Grace stealing it, and also introducing both Gabriel and the entity. Your friends from the airport saw them in the hallway a few minutes ago. You could have said something sooner. Well, they were chasing you, not me. Yes, but he is your ticket out of here. If he gets snatched before you leave, you're f***ed. And if you don't care about him being your escape route, why give over all the information about why you were hired? Probably because Ethan told her he'd know if she's lying, and since she hoped he'd get arrested, the shared information wouldn't matter anyway since he'd supposedly be in prison. <gasps> Only in Italy could the word for pervert sound so adorable. F***ing Italy. Again, shouldn't that be a sin for Italy and not the movie? And double, of course. There's a motorcycle for Hunt because Tom Cruise loves motorcycles. And sending Tom Cruise on a motorcycle cliche. Hunt, Hunt listen to me. me. Listen to me. Let her go and put him on. Hunt is pretty well cornered here, but fear not. There's a deus ex mantissimo right around the corner. How? Paris is working for Gabriel and wants to find a key that Grace gave away. So if anything, this is adding further problems for Ethan to solve. It ain't a deus ex machina. This is almost as bad as when you call the asteroid being sucked into the black hole in Treasure Planet that. I'm done. I'm not doing this. People are chasing us. I mean, you'd think so, wouldn't you? But they always seem to be nowhere to be seen when you guys need to stop for a bit of talkie-talkie. This scene would make a whole lot more sense if they weren't hiding in the middle of an alleyway. What are we doing? Finding us a new car. Wait, were safe house, safe boat, and safe car the only options? What if I needed a safe plane, a safe bank, or some safe sex? The sex thing was obviously a joke, but why would they need a bank? They're secret agents, and I have a feeling a plane would be hard to come by. Hey, look, I'm, I'm sorry. This is... It's okay. No, this car, the way they... It's okay. See, it's funny because the confident man is having performance issues in front of the pretty lady. You're right. That's exactly why this is hilarious. Wait, that's a sin? 2023 movie using the Spanish steps as a place to do crazy automobile stunts cliche. Okay, so it was just the two movies, but if your buddy in the category is Fast X, you're getting a sin. I mean, even if this isn't the best Mission Impossible movie, we can at least agree it's leagues better than Fast X, right? I've run this back several times and they are clearly still handcuffed to each other when they crash on the tracks. So she had three seconds to get the paper clip, unlock her handcuff, and attach it to the steering wheel without looking and with a single hand? And all without one of the most observant humans in history noticing the cuff netigans? Nope. Grace has been established to be a master pickpocket, and we earlier saw her use a paper clip to get off handcuffs before this scene. So I can buy this. 
Not to mention, you're again criticizing Ethan for not being smart enough to see this, while also questioning how he was able to do insane things. Hunt actually seems happy to see Ilsa instead of shouting, Why aren't you staying dead? I have risked so much to keep you alive, goddammit. Hey, at least she isn't out in the open where the IMF can see her. And she has information that she needs to share. You don't know Gabriel. I do. No, you knew who he was. The last time you saw Gabriel was close to, if not more than, 30 years ago. For all you know, he's turned over a new leaf and just really likes international travel. Yeah, sure. But it was also explained to him that the entity specifically chose him to be its messenger. So I doubt he turned a new leaf. No, you have to go. You all, you have to go. Ethan. This is the part of the movie where Ethan convinces everyone he has to do this alone. And they say, no, Ethan, we love you. We can risk our lives if we want. And he'll say, man, I love you guys. Isn't friendship great? I hope I can live with myself when you all die. That's actually not what happens. Luther, Benji, and Ilsa point out that maybe splitting up is exactly what the Entity wants, and that they need to think about how to fight against it without emotion and more logically. And isn't it interesting that you're saying this over the characters explaining that, as if you're hiding what the movie is actually saying? The Entity knows who we are. Any move we make, it's probably considered it. Anything we do, we have to assume that it's counting on us to do it. It's almost like having a supposed all-seeing, all-knowing force that we know nothing about as your antagonist sucks all the tension right out of the story, huh? How? Doesn't this make it scarier, knowing that it can predict anyone's moves and that they need to think outside the box? I'd say that gives this movie tension. Don't mind me. I'm just standing here thinking about my thoughts against the most cinematic backdrop possible. Okay, whatever. But why did you write the words at sunset in the subtitles, but then didn't actually say those words out loud? It's my first time in Venice. And it's my first time in this movie to skip. Hey, this is one of the last moments with Ilsa before her lame death. You better take it in for as long as you can. And you're Gabriel, I presume. I've heard so very little about you. Same, lady. Same. Yelling at the screen. Should I know you? Jeez, Grace, they did a whole circle jerk of exposition about her like five minutes ago to avoid this confusion. Keep up! This line was said because she realized that Alana hired her. It's in the last place you would ever think to look. Oh, f*** off. How does that immediately equate to Zola's pocket? Did Tom Cruise train to be psychic for this movie? Or Ethan saw Zola searching her. He knows that she's a good pickpocket and therefore put two and two together. This is again, you underestimating him, even though you literally called him smart earlier. You could even say that this party is that interested party. You could also say that this party thinks the party that is that party and bored this party. Skip! Parsing every possible cause and effect, every scenario, however implausible, into a very real map of a most probable next. So this whole situation is some kind of mix between the precogs and Minority Report, Skynet from Terminator, and Doctor Strange and Infinity War. Neat. In the case of both Minority Report and Infinity War, the future predictors were working for the good guys, while in this movie, it's the literal villain. But I'm more confused with the Terminator reference. When did Skynet predict the future? Are you referring to them knowing that Sarah would give birth to John? They were already in the future long after that, so they weren't predicting the future. Did you even watch those movies? Fine, fine, fine. The black and white costuming here is pretty cool. Gabriel is dressed in white with a black undershirt to indicate he thinks he's an angel but is dark at his core. Ethan is in a black suit with a white shirt underneath because he feels lost in darkness but his soul is pure. Alana is dressed in all white because her motives are clear and Ilsa in all black because her fate is not. And Grace is in perfect balance of white and black to represent that she is the key to balancing the force. Or some shit. Now can we please get back to an action scene for fuck's sake? I was curious to see where you were going with this, and now I'm underwhelmed. You said all of that just to ask the movie to get to another action scene? Why didn't you just say that? Oh, right, the runtime. Almost forgot. This is the second time in this movie that someone has used sleight of hand to show a valuable item to someone who didn't know they had it, and it was dumb both times. I already explained the first time, but in this case, it was just a mess with him, dude. Tom Cruise finds an excuse to sprint in a move. Wait, haven't we done this one already? You've done this many times in this franchise, and I think it's still sinful that you think it's sinful to watch Tom Cruise running. The entity is knocking out satellites faster than I can hack into them. Luther's fleshy brain seems shocked that a computer is better at computing than he is. I mean, this is the same guy that has done a ton of insane hacking in the previous movies. I don't blame him for being surprised. Bringing knives to an AI fight. What? Presenting your weapons for observation instead of immediately using them. It's almost like Grace underestimates Gabriel or something. <laughs> 
There it is. That decision to run away instead of kill her will ultimately change the game. And the eventual singularity happens, and we all wonder why love didn't save us from the AI apocalypse. Just remember, it's this movie's fault for putting that idea in your head in the first place. I feel like that'd be stupid if people take movies that seriously. Oh, wait, I'm talking to the master of that craft. Bullshit. Ilsa is a badass and doesn't deserve to hit the fridge this easily. Yep, I was really hoping you'd send this scene. I don't hate this movie like some people do. I find it enjoyable enough, but I do agree this scene really brought my score down. Ilsa only dies to give Ethan motivation, and it's just so lame after their romance has been teased for two movies. I'm legitimately hoping she comes back in the next movie, though even I'll admit that seems unlikely. It was her first time in Venice. <laughs> Her first time in Venice. Stacking chairs like this. This BS. In one outcome, you die on that train. In another outcome, you kill Gabriel. In both cases, the entity wins. Does it though? Your logic is based on Gabriel being the only way to find out what the key unlocks, and you have no idea if that's true. In fact, if that were true, wouldn't the entity just kill Gabriel itself and be done with it? I'm just saying, if I were Ethan, you'd have to do a lot more to pour cold water on my revenge boner than these giant assumptions and conjecture. Why would the entity kill Gabriel? It needs him to get the key. You know, the MacGuffin of this movie? It knows that Ethan wants the key to deactivate it, so asking Gabriel to get it before him makes perfect sense. Also, Jeremy says boner. I managed to make a, a widow mask with Grace, but then it just shorted out in the middle of making yours. The only error message it gave was cannot complete motorcycle stunt required for plot.exe to continue. What's wrong with that? I personally love that this technology doesn't always work. That was one of the reasons Ghost Protocol was so good. And yeah, without it, we don't have the awesome motorcycle sequence. You'll find another way to get me on that train. I just need a curve where it's going slow enough for me to jump on. Well, thank goodness we acted that out because my imagination is far too basic to have pictured that on its own. Promise me you'll be on that train. I will be there, no matter what. And if it just so happens to require me to pull off an incredibly dangerous stunt that make for great promo material, so be it. Yelling at the screen times two. Self-drive activated. You know, the first thing I'm gonna do when the sentient AI goes rogue, not trust the self-driving car to not throw me off a mountain. Then it's a good thing this car is offline, isn't it? Please don't disturb me before the meeting. I mean, that's just f***ing lucky, right? How was Grace supposed to switch places with Lana if she had decided to keep Zola at her side? Do you seriously think Zola would be with her at all times? You think he's there when she goes to the bathroom? How do we know hers isn't a counterfeit either right now? Who's going to check the precious alloys? That's kind of what the later scene with Kittredge is for. You're not Alana Metsopolis. Well, the Alana I remember was yay high. Oh, you false tension mongering drama tease. Somehow Kittredge has a history with Alana, which could lead to Grace thinking she's been exposed when she hasn't. And even so, who the f would phrase it that way? Somehow has history? I guess you forgot Alana is the daughter of Max, who Kittredge has a history with. Remember? You sinned the first movie a few years ago. Well, I did a She did a job for me. The Grace we met went head to head with Ethan and kept her poise and cool the entire time. But now that the script needs some tension, she's fumbling her words. This is what's known in the business as plot-based character fuckery sh**. Got another lingo. You know Grace isn't an IMF agent, right? This is literally her first time wearing a mask. Why do you expect her to be perfect at this immediately? Isn't that exactly what Ray Palpatine gets criticized for? We were able to transmit an early copy of the AI to Russia's newest submarine. I think I remember something about that from like two hours ago. Hard to tell. There's been a lot of meaningless action since then, but I'll do my best to keep up. <laughs> and you're the same guy who criticized Grace for supposedly not keeping up. You wish to form an access with the entity. Purge your government of old think and create a new super state to rule the world. Wait, America were the bad guys all along? And Carrie Elways is playing a character not entirely on the up and up? Who conceived of such a unique twist? I doubt it was meant to be a twist. Handing over the keys to the apocalypse when only 13% of the blockchain has been decrypted. Why not? The decision's already been made, and after the phone finishes, it then gives Grace the option to either confirm or decline. Power of Boner's Revenge and Regular gives Ethan the strength to pull off this stunt. Jeremy says Boner. You showed this so much in your promo material marketing and even this movie's opening credits that all this feels a little bit anticlimactic. This movie is flawed, but you seriously decided to send this scene 
This scene deserved at least five sins off. I want to like Kittredge. I really do. But how can this dumbass think the key to stopping the most intelligent and deadly AI ever conceived is worthy of slipping into his jacket pocket? Not even his inside pocket. He kind of doesn't know that Grace is posing as Alana right now. Just saying. Storing your person killer next to your person maker. Jeremy says boner for a third time. Ah! The hilarious bullshit that is Ethan X hunting into this exact car at this exact time. Yes, I said hilarious. I also said bullshit. Judging by the X you put in there, it sounds like you're referring to this as a deus ex machina, which it isn't since you show the setup earlier. Also, also help me if someone in the comments pipes up about that this was the way Entity planned it. I will first curse your username and then remind you that such a thing would make it even more of a literal deus ex machina. So shush. How? Well, it looks like it's fist fight on a moving train in a Mission Impossible movie o'clock. Are you saying we've seen this kind of action in this franchise before? The only other time there was a train action scene was the first one, and I'm pretty sure Ethan and Jim weren't directly fighting each other since that train was going way faster than this one. Did he just put his whole body weight plus centrifugal force onto a six inch blade stuck into the side of a train? I mean, there are plenty of cases where six inches is plenty to get the job done, but I don't think this is one of them. Why is that? Don't you do it! I'm not sure which makes less sense. That Chief Wiggum somehow shows up at the exact right time on top of a moving train or that Ethan would even care. He should care though, since Luther gave him that whole speech about how he shouldn't kill Gabriel since he knows what the key unlocks. This movie is full of all sorts of nonsense. But this next five minutes of vertical escape room story train edition is some of the most fun nonsense to ever have no sense. Is that fun enough to overcome the nonsense? Yes, yes it is. And as usual, I will also remove a sin for you praising a really good sequence in a Mission Impossible movie. <laughs> Ethan says, thank you, Mr. McQuarrie, for making sure I left the parachute in this exact spot in a compartment that didn't get pulled off the edge, strangely. Cool, cool, but misspelling Christopher McQuarrie's last name. The closer someone gets to you, the harder it is to keep them alive. I'm warning you, movie, you better not be foreshadowing a Benji sacrifice. If anything happens to them, there is no place you and your god will be safe. There's no place that I won't go to send you. That is written. Should any members of your team be caught or killed? Oh, f I mean, I agree that I don't want Benji to die, but I'm sending you for double dipping and also giving this movie a send for something that might happen in the next one. Probably should save it for when that movie eventually comes out. <laughs>